This video is brought to you by our amazing supporters over at Patreon. Hey everyone, it's Ben from Board to Bits, and in this video we're going to make our flock able to iterate through all of its agents so that those agents can find their relevant neighbors and apply their behaviors based on the context of those neighbors. So let's jump over to Visual Studio and our flock script, and we're going to go down to update, and this is where we're going to start actually iterating through each of our agents. Now we have that list of agents that we created, so that's going to make it really easy for us. Uh, we can simply iterate through these with a for each loop. We'll say for each flock agent, we'll just call it agent in our list called agents. And what we're going to do here is we're going to set up a list of transforms. We're going to call this list context. This is sort of the what 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 context exist what what things exist in the context of our neighbor radius, and we're going to set this equal to get nearby objects and pass in the current agent that we're looking at. Now we're going to need to set up this actual method for this to work. So below update, we're going to say list transform get nearby objects and it's going to take in a flock agent called agent. Now how we're going to get our nearby objects is we're going to use Unity's physics system. You could technically say iterate through all your agents and see which ones have you know a distance that's within the radius, but I've actually found that Unity is a little bit more operant just if you simply run a physics kind of overlap check and see what, um, what other agents get hit. So how we'll do this is we're going to say again in here list transform context equals, and we're going to say this is a new list of transforms. So an empty list that we can populate, and then we'll pass that back um, to our update method here. And so the other thing we're going to create is a collider array. We're going to call this um, context colliders. We're going to set this equal to physics 2D dot overlap circle all. And so this is going to create a circle, kind of imaginary circle in space at a point and with a radius that we choose and see what colliders are within it. And so we're going to, the point we want is our agent dot transform dot position. And the radius that we want is our neighbor radius. Oh, we need to make sure that we are setting our collider uh, array as a collider 2D array, not just collider array, so that we're getting um, 2D colliders here, which is what is being returned from physics 2D. Again, this is a situation where if you're you doing this in a 3D, you would probably be doing this where you're just getting an array of colliders, and then you're just going to use physics dot overlap sphere. Okay, and now what we can do is we can iterate through this set of colliders that we found, and what we really just want to do is look and see um, for each collider in this array, as long as it's not ourselves, then we want to take the transform attached to that collider and put it into the list. So we'll say for each collider C in context colliders, if C does not equal agent dot, and this is where we're going to use that agent collider that we created, and this just saves us from having to run um, get component every single time that we do this. So as long as the collider isn't our own collider that we're currently, for the agent that we're working with, then we will add to context, we will add C dot transform. Oops, and I keep on forgetting to add the 2D to my uh, collider types there, so make sure that you have those in there. But then finally, 
once we've added all of the other colliders that we found, we can return context. So at this point here now, this gets passed back to our update method, and we've got this list of nearby objects to the agent. Now we're going to actually use them by calculating a move based on the agent and those nearby objects. So we'll say vector2 move equals behavior dot calculate move and we're going to pass in the three parameters that that takes which is the agent, the context which are those transforms that we found, and this which is the flock itself. This will, the behavior then will take over at this point, the scriptable object will run whatever um, calculations it needs to and return back to us a vector2 which is this is the way that the agent should move. So at this point here we will then take our move, multiply it by itself, uh, or multiply it by our drive factor so that we get that speedier movement. And then we're just going to check, once we've done this multiplication, have we exceeded our maximum speed that we want? And if so, we're simply going to pull it back so that it caps out at the maximum speed. And so we'll do this by saying if move dot square magnitude, and remember this is so that we're getting, um, we're not having to do that square root action, is greater than square max speed. So once again, now we're just using the square against the square. It's all just you know relative comparison, so it still works the way we'd want it to. If it is greater, meaning we've exceeded the maximum speed, then we're going to set our move equal to move.normalized times our max speed. So that's basically going to say reset this back so that it's um, at a magnitude of 1 and then multiply it to the max speed so it is exactly at that max speed for us. And then finally, we'll say agent.move and pass in that move that we've calculated. So that is actually everything we need to make our um, flock move around and behave now. However, we don't have any behaviors currently, so we can't actually see this in action. However, we can test that our getting our nearby objects is working using a simple line of code. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to comment out all of this for a second. I'm going to do control K, control C to comment this block of code just so that we're not trying to use behaviors that don't exist. And what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to basically set, we're going to get the nearby, find how many neighbors we have, and then based on that, set our color of our sprite and it's going to get more and more, um, it's, it'll start out at white if it has no neighbors, and then as it gets closer to a certain number of neighbors, it'll turn red. So we'll do this by saying agent.getComponent sprite renderer dot color equals color dot lerp we're going to kind of interpolate between color.white, which is when we have zero neighbors, and we'll say color.red when we have a certain number of neighbors. And then we're going to interpolate based on that number. So we're going to say context.length, or sorry, context.count, because it's a list divided by 6f. So if there are six neighbors, it'll be completely red. If there are zero neighbors, it'll be white, and then otherwise it'll be something in between. Now this is not an optimized, it would really be better if we had cached this. Um, so this is not something that we would want to run every single uh, frame, but for the purposes of just kind of debugging right now and checking it out, it'll work fine for us. So what I'm gonna do is I am just gonna say here though, for demo only, and we can comment this out after we've used it. But I did want to quickly show this to you guys so that you can see that this is, even though things aren't going to be moving on the screen, this is actually working. So what we should see now is when we hit play, something is not, oh, right. Our sprite render is not actually on the object itself, it's on the child, so we need to say get component in children. So it's even even less optimized. Again, we definitely don't want to be using this, you know, in our final build. But again, for kind of demoing and debug purposes, this will work okay. Jump back and we'll say play. And here we see now 
that we're getting these kind of slight pinks in places where there are you know a few neighbors and then when we get to a place like this here where this one has a number of neighbors that are close enough to it it becomes that really deep red and so we see that we are in fact getting that neighbor information um, based on the color changes that we see so in our next video we're going to actually start getting into implementing our behaviors so that our flocks can move based on the flocking algorithm um, and actually get moving and start getting that um, behavior that we want. As always, like and subscribe if you liked these videos. Uh, consider supporting on Patreon. And in the meantime, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.